Ms. Dixon, welcome. Good morning, Chairwoman Stabenow, Ranking Member Bozeman, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. I'm so honored to be here, and I look forward to discussing the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act. My name is Danelle Dixon, and I am the CEO and Executive Director of the Stellar Development Foundation. Before I speak about the, uh, the opportunities that are presented by the DCCPA, I'd like to share a bit more about the Stellar Development Foundation and the Stellar Network, and most importantly, the real-world solutions built with this technology. The Stellar Development Foundation, or SDF, was established alongside the Stellar Network in 2014 with the mission of creating equitable access to the global financial system by using the underlying technology presented by Stellar. The Stellar Network is an open, permissionless, decentralized ledger, or a blockchain network, optimized for payments and asset issuance, particularly useful with stablecoins in payments. Today, rather than talking about the things that we read about in the press with respect to trading or speculation, I'd like to highlight a payment service that was built on Stellar, launched in the dead of the crypto winter this summer. In June, MoneyGram, Circle, and a growing number of digital wallets launched a first of its kind global service that enables anyone to, to convert cash to digital assets without a bank, without a bank account, without a credit card. This service utilizes the Stellar blockchain and Circle's USDC coin, it's a stable coin, to allow cash funding and payout in different currencies all around the world. The Stellar Network provides the digital rails to make payments fast and secure. USDC provides a truly stable digital asset. And while MoneyGram provides a global network of cash in and cash out locations, this is true interoperability with the existing financial system. In practical terms, what this means is that an immigrant farm worker in Michigan or Kansas or California or anywhere in the world can send her hard-earned cash to her family and to her home country without experiencing outsized fees or uncertain wait times. She can walk into a local MoneyGram location, typically a supermarket or a pharmacy, with $100 in cash, and in minutes from start to finish, she can convert that $100 into virtual dollars in USDC. And that's deposited directly into her digital wallet. On the other side of the transaction, her parents could visit their local MoneyGram location and cash out of their own USDC from their digital wallet that she sent to them into their local fiat currency when they need that. This is available right now and is being used right now. This novel service gives neglected, unbanked, underbanked, and cash-reliant populations a pathway to enter the digital economy. So, let me turn now to the legislation. The DCCPA goes a long way towards allowing the kind of regulatory framework that will offer the opportunity for these types of payment services to, be, to, be, to flourish. And it also, ident by identifying the CFTC as the, sp as the spot market regulator. The agency's history of vetting and approving new products demonstrates it is well suited for this type of responsibility. We also applaud the focus on consumer protection and education and its inclusion of the study on energy consumption related to digital commodities. It is also encouraging to see that this bill sets out a process for listing stablecoins and that it is consistent with the PWG report with payment stablecoins not being included as securities. We agree with that and they're necessary for payments. Rightfully, the DCCPA has defined a digital commodity while recognizing the SEC's jurisdiction. Unfortunately, it fails to address the fundamental question that plagues this industry and has for far too long. When is a digital asset considered a commodity versus a security? The Howey test does not include a clear definition, and it was not an agency-created rule. The industry desperately needs a definition, and the DCCPA is the perfect vehicle for it. Not all digital assets are created equal. As an example of the challenges we face defining digital assets, I referenced the Minnesota and Iowa State Fairs in my written testimony, which require tickets in order to experience the full fair experiences, much like you need digital assets to engage with particular networks and services. We need a practical, principles-based framework that focuses on asset functionality. 
With an appropriate and clear policy and regulatory framework, digital asset and blockchain have great potential to improve access to financial services for millions of people. I believe that the DCCPA is a consequential step towards creating this vision. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much, and very much appreciate all of these suggestions about further ways that we can improve, uh, improve this legislation. So thank you very much. Ms. Dixon, um, colleagues on the House Financial Services Committee are working on a bill to regulate stable coins, as we know. Uh, how would that legislation interact with our bill, uh, giving the CFTC the authority to re regulate digital commodities? Thank you, Senator. That's, uh, it's, it's such a great opportunity to be able to have these bills work together. Having a clear definition of what truly is a stable coin is so important. We already see in this bill there's a process for listing stable coins, but it's really important because a lot of what we read about in the early days of the summer focused on things that were labeled stable coins but were not one-to-one -one backed with fiat, didn't have audit requirements, didn't have the transparency that we think is important not just for American consumers, but also for business who's, who want to leverage these stable coins, as I mentioned in the MoneyGram example. So creating that very clear definition of what is a stable coin, holding those assets in a secured financial depository account, making sure that you can't have, that if you do have a run on the bank, that there's not going to be a problem for the constituents that cho choose to get their money out. These are all really, really important pieces that we think need to be addressed, and we see not just the, the bill in the House, but also the proposal that Senator Gillibrand and Lemus put together with respect to um, of stable coins and defining stable coins. We'd love to see the idea that we continue to have innovation in this space, but it is regulated innovation around stable coins. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And I have numerous other questions, but I'm going to stop at this point. I'm going to go and vote and leave the committee and the capable hands of Senator Bozeman. So don't mess it up. <laughs> so I'm getting a little responsibility. That's great. Ms. Dixon, again, another thing, and this has been discussed already, but, but I think it is important because it does come up. Uh, it's my understanding the energy consumption required for proof of work consensus mechanism transaction validations can be significant. Uh, which is why I'm glad our legislation looks to study the issue. What is your view on measuring energy usage related to various consensus mechanisms in the crypto space? Thank you so much for the question, Senator Bozeman, and, I, and thank you for your leadership uh, and that of your staff on this. Uh, the environmental and what the, what the bill presupposes about the study that needs to be done with respect to the environmental impact of all the different consensus, consensus mechanisms is so important. It's something that we do in lots of other industries to be able to figure out the benefits and the harm that uh, each of the industries or each of the, the uh, different challenges bring uh, to uh, the United States. Dif all consensus mechanisms are not alike, uh, but importantly, what we can do and what we're hopeful that this study does is create a framework for how to measure the carbon output uh, and, and figure out what we need to do as an industry to even further improve it. We just saw last night, I think it was at 2.34 a.m., uh, in uh, Eastern time where uh, Ethereum moved from proof of work to proof of stake. That was already a momentous shift from that in terms of de demonstrating the, the imp increased sustainability for uh, that network by moving to proof of stake. So I think, again, not all consensus mechanisms are created equally, but if we think about a framework, which we've done, by the way, we've um, engaged PwC to create a, that kind of framework to consider how you should, and we've done it with respect to the Stellar Network, what pieces of the Stellar Network and what pieces of the transactions should be viewed when you're looking at the, the sustainability impact as a whole. Uh, we, would, we welcome that kind of framework. framework. We think that the industry needs that to be able to create um, consistency and to understand really truly the value and also the, the potential harm and what we can do to improve on it. Good. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, thank you very much, Senator Bozeman. Thanks so much to all of you, and we uh, appreciate your testimony. Look forward to continuing to work with you, and also appreciate so much uh, Chairman Benham and his leadership at the CFTC, which is going to be so critical moving forward. We, we saw last year a lot of volatility in the marketplace, and we have a bill that's going to address that to make digital commodities safer for Americans to use and to trade. And again, 
uh, investing in and supporting the innovation and the opportunities as well. So I think this is a really important opportunity for us to move forward. And I'm hoping our colleagues will join us on this bipartisan bill so we can get the CFTC to work. And uh, again, thank you. The, the record will remain open for five business days for members to submit additional questions or statements. And without further comment, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.